so Stefan is uh, basically from Munich and he's running his own software consulting company uh, named Stefan Barish Software Consulting. Uh, he'll be talking about golden master testing in Python and uh, he has uh, interest in text processing and machine learning uh, with respect to text. Uh, apart from that, he is quite inclined towards automation and GUI programming, and he has spent a lot of time during his PhD on automation testing. So thanks a lot, uh, Brian, uh, sorry, uh, Stephen, for joining. Uh, yeah, over to you. Yeah, you're very much welcome. So it's been a long conference so far, so I'll try to keep things very, very simple. We are essentially talking about rubber ducks and well, how you would test rubber ducks and other things with Python. So to provide some background, I um, did a lot of testing in my past. It's actually what brought me into programming a couple of years ago. And yeah, since then I thought about different ways to test and how to make testing easier to do well with Python and with some other technologies. And well, before we get started, let's have some background and what's golden master testing. Let's imagine it's in the summer months that you have a, um, a summer job and you work for somebody who produces rubber ducks. A lot of nice little rubber ducks. Now, let's also assume that you're not a rubber duck expert. So you don't really know what a good rubber duck should look like, how much it should weight. And well, Honestly, you don't really have the time to learn all these aspects of rubber ducks. But in your job, you, you should do some quality control. So you should be able to decide, is this a good duck or a bad duck? So you come up with the following approach. You ask the person that you work for just to, well, be available. And every time that you see a duck that looks kind of particular, so like this red guy here, you ask them, is it really a good rubber duck? Should that work? And if he says, yes, well, then you continue with the production. Maybe even you remember, okay, that's a good duck. That's what a good black duck is supposed to look like. Now, we are not only testing, well, rubber ducks, we are testing programs, but you can go to a similar situation. You might imagine that you have an old, well-established system, and thus the system produces some kind of output. It might be an image, it might be text, it might be a web page. And you don't really know what this data is supposed to look like. So you have a rough overview. It should obviously not be, well, totally defective, but you don't know the details. And you ultimately ask the computer to do the same stuff that you did earlier with the rubber ducks. So you say, okay, computer, please compare the output of my current run with all the previous runs and if you see something that's different, then please notify me and I'll have a look. And maybe whatever now happens is the new normal, the new standard, and we'll just continue with production. Okay, so bringing this back from our ducks to more computer-like things, this could mean, for example, that you look at a website. And if you look at the website here on the left, there are a lot of little document, well, little elements that might, may have changed, may not have changed. It might be a log, to, um, a log file. So maybe you monitor the behavior of your old system with a log file and you want to know how does, do things change? And now things get slightly more interesting. Of course, you would need to make a decision. What do I actually look at? In an example of the log file, do I only look for the presence of some log messages or do I want to make sure that certain errors are not there? Do I compare um, execution times? So what you really want to do is take an established known good output, compare it with the current results of your execution and then write a program that compares some part of the past execution with the current execution. And if this is not the same, well, notify you. And ultimately, that's all that is to this talk. So we will just go through some more further examples, provide some details and show you extremely simple implementation how this can work in Python. So I think it's, it's not even on GitHub yet. It's, I think it's 100 lines. Okay, I hope that's interesting. 
So when would you use this? Maybe you have a legacy system and don't really know the outputs. We talked about this. Maybe you have an extremely large um, system of data. So you want to compare, let's say, well, a large data set and you don't really want to write many, many small assert statements, but just want to compare the output. Or maybe you must just do some small changes and want to make sure that there are also just some small uh, well, changes in the output. Yeah, and this is all that well, this is all the process we have to implement for do this. So we have a program and we run our program and capture the output. Now we have some files or maybe some data set entries that show us this is how, how things normally look, what they should look like. So then we change our program and then we run it again and capture the output again. Now, if nothing has changed, so we can assume that if we capture enough output, that the program is still correct. So if you well, do some calculations on a data set and have maybe some two Excel files and compare, well, the results in Excel file one from one one from the unmodified programs are the same as an Excel file two from the modified program and everything's the same, then it's good. Now, it gets slightly more interesting if you ask yourself what will when things are different. This brings us into the, well, why these kinds of tests are actually known under diff different names. So what I call golden master tests, characterization tests, because the execution result characterizes the run. They are called approval tests. So the assumption there is that you'll have to approve changes quite often because they're quite often, well, that's our program changes, changes also the output. Or you could call them snapshot tests because especially in web programming, the JavaScript will, you basically take a snapshot of your web page, compare it with another snapshot and compare whether things still are, are still correct. So you might find this with, well, under different names. Now, the most simple way to implement this is just to say, okay, I capture all the output, whatever it is, compared to all the new output. And if there's something different, I'll have to look. But this can be quite tedious. So imagine you have a program that produces, let's say, a couple of megabytes of output and log data, a log file, or you have a large website that you um, generate with some Django templates. You don't really want to say, okay, something's different. How do I find this? So you need to do, you know, you need to look at some implementation decisions. And if we follow this execution flow, we, first of all, we want to introduce this in our usual test framework. So we want to have something that we can assert in an assert statement. And we want to check if data already exists. If no data exists for this test, then we just capture whatever we want to produce. If we um, want already have data, then we have to compare it. And then we'll have to create something that our computer can help us or that Python can help us to compare. So essentially we want to diff some part of the output. And when we do this, we can run our test. We have now a slightly smaller part of information that we need to look at. And we can hopefully look at the diff result and approve or reject the test results. So that's an essential part. The first part is a search um, check data will trigger whenever there is a change in the part of the output that you specified. And the approval process, that's you, where you say, okay, that looks different than the last time, but it's still okay. Well, and in order to keep this manageable, we'll have to make some design decisions. We cannot in good conscience say that we just capture everything. So we have to decide what do we look at? Do we look at our project, our program state? So maybe we just um, use an automated debugging and capture whatever the internal data structures of our programs are like. 
Do we look at log data? Do we look at a textual output, an Excel file, etc.? So what can we look at from our program that would tell us whatever we're interested in? Yeah. Then the next question is, how many tests do we actually want? If we have just one important output, let's say just one Excel file, it might be tempting to say, okay, we just compare everything. As soon as the one cell in this Excel file is changed, we want to review it. Or we could say we break it down. We make, let's say, 10 tests, and each looks at a one specific part of the output. So maybe at a different worksheet. Or if you have an image, maybe you say only look at this particular area of the image because that's where we maybe in a graph print out some of the um, relevant information and the rest is just, well, more for interest. We have to decide how do we actually store whatever information we're interested in. Because at some later point, we want to be able to go back and look at this information. And first of all, have our computer compare and tell us what's different, what has changed. And we want to also be able to look at it ourselves and say, is this the change that we really find relevant? And well, to make finding the differences easier, we also have to decide on how do we actually diff that. If mentioned that you, let's say, have a Python program and you write out some the internal state to disk. So you could use pickle, you could use JSON, you could probably um, write it out as a, well, purely textual representation. You could write something yourself. And depending on what you choose, you have more or less readable data and you have different data volumes that you would need to look at. Well, and finally, whenever you do something like that, there's always something in your data that you most likely want to ignore. Let's say you have a run that you um, do every day and you create a log, data, a log file. And this log file would most likely include the current date and time. If you just did a comparison with the um, date and time, then you would have a change in almost every line for almost every run every day. So it would be, well, you would say that everything has changed. So whenever you design such a system, you would need to decide which of the data that I want to use for my comparison. Do I want to throw away? Do I want to ignore? Or do I want to simplify? The same with floating point numbers. If you have floating point numbers, maybe you don't really need all the digits, but maybe you just take the first, let's say three digits um, after the point and move from there. And well, these are all things that you can decide for your little program. So what do I want to test? What it is that I'm really interested in? How do I want to represent it so I can easily compare it and see whether it's still what I expect? And what are the things that will change with every one, even if the um, program itself hasn't, re hasn't really changed? Yeah, and what I did for this talk is I went for an extremely simple approach. The reason being is that while you have some libraries that can do that for you, what, what I found is that these libraries um, can only provide so much in terms of workflow. So they help you to integrate your tests with um, PyTest or with other unit test frameworks. But all these decisions that we saw before are decisions that you will have to make for your program. So the libraries, for me at least, didn't add too much. On the other hand, Python provides us with a lot of interesting little modules and well, built-in features really, that make it quite easy to take a piece of data, transform it in such a way that only the relevant parts remain and later on compare it with something different. And that's for my little test case, I just went with um, um, basic JSON format. I went for JSON pickle so I can pickle an internal data state as a JSON file. But well, if you wanted to do something different for an image, you have pillow for data frames, you can 
either compare them at Excel, then you have even diff, um, external diff tools for Excel, or, well, you could also write them out as JSON. That's one of the things that is, well, where Python and Golden Master testing work quite well together because in other programming languages, you would either have to implement everything yourself or you would have a harder time to represent internal state in its own difficult format. You know, we, to a certain degree, we talked about that. So what do we want to ignore? In essence, everything that will change, even if you didn't change the programs that you want to test. So if everything's changed the same anyways, there is no reason to um, keep this data in. On the other hand, if you have a log file and you want to compare execution times, so you don't really um, care whether it's executed on a Friday or on a Wednesday, but you want to know from the time that this particular program part started to the end of this run, shouldn't be more than two minutes, then you, well, would need to look, take this log file and transform it so that you have the difference in time while you ignore the total time. And we already went for that. Most likely you would start with just one large test or a couple of large tests and then realize as you execute them that they are, well, that you have to approve too much at once. That the diff um, shows you too much data and then you break it down into many smaller tests. Yeah. And well, if you, once you have your data, you want properly want to store it, meaning that, well, first of all, you have to be able to compare it to the next one. But in some cases, you might even be interested to see how it changed over time. So you don't even change, um, compare the latest with the previous results, but you go back some time just to avoid that you have some drift in your data. It could be interesting, for example, if you don't really program the system for one specific output, but if you train some kind of model and want to lock into, uh, want to look into drift in the model. Okay, now we go for extremely simple implementation. That we keep things extremely simple here. So I just used JSON pickle to have a more or less human readable, but also machine friendly format. Um, you could use XML, you could use a custom text format, but for most of the things that I worked with, JSON is usually something that is easily to get and good enough to compare. I just went for standard unified diff. We'll see this as in a, well, in a toy example, but it just allows you to see how did my object change. And what I did here was just, I write some JSON files somewhere in my um, data dictionary. So close to my program code. And I just keep two versions, the current version and the latest version. And I just write four operations. First is a check operation, called the check operation, as you can see with the name, and it just tells you, um, this is my data, this is the name, please compare it to the previous one, or if you don't know it, store it. You have a list operation, that is usually something that you would run from a command line that just shows you what the um, current status of all these gold master tests are. So it's a currently a conflict between two different versions or do the versions, are the versions equal? And finally, for your approval process, you have the review and approve um, steps. Review just shows you what is different between the current and the last result. And approve just tells, okay, I know so that this latest version is different, but that's okay. Just save it as it is and consider the new changed version the new, well, gold master. So the version that you're testing in. I went extremely simple here. So I just have a simple Python class just for testing purposes. And well, some different data types in there. And 
for this toy example, we'll just use two different instances of the data. So we create just one class instance with all the default data here. And then we just well, change it a little bit. So we remove one entry here and we change some data here. So what we can do here is that we don't really have to filter and ignore anything. You could always say that when you um, prepare the export, that you take your exported JSON and just remove some of the keys. But for simplicity sakes, here we just look at everything. And this is what a well, standard run would look like. So I just have one little class and this class just stores where it should keep the Q and golden masters. So all the data that we're working from. And then in order to run or to use golden master tests, assuming that we don't have any data previously saved, we just take our test data, our test class, and provide a name and say check. The first time we say check, we just save the data. So as you'll see later, we just create a JSON version and write out this JSON version. And since there's nothing to check, this would be a success. Now, the next time we run the same thing with the same test data and with the same name, it, the assert statement will still be true because the data hasn't changed. Now, normally you wouldn't run those just after another, but you would say, this is my test one. And between these, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Um, this is my last, um, this is my last one. This is my next one, nothing has changed, okay. Now, if we have some change data, then the same thing will happen, but now the assert statement will fail. Okay, so I know that my results have changed and I have to approve the results, different code master. What I can then do is just list the differences and see, okay, test one, everything's okay. Test two, there's difference. So I'll ask them, okay, please help me to review test two. So what's different here? And if I'm convinced that the result is still correct, I would just run the approval. Well, and from a user perspective, it could look like this. So you list the results and you see, okay, name one, everything's okay. Name two, there's a difference and the difference is apparently here. If I review name two, I just get the unified diff formats that the well, standard lib library give, gives me. And I see some value here has changed. So you see here it's 2.8, here it's 2.3. And we have different entry, entries in our array. And if I say, okay, that's still okay. That's basically what I expected. I did make some changes, some changes, then you can approve it. Okay, now a quick run over the Python implementation. I think it's 180 lines, so it's extremely, um, well, it wasn't much work. And I guess what I mostly want to show you with this is how many of the required parts are already part of the Python ecosystem. So you can just take your object, you say, say Jason Pickle, please provide me with a text representation. You will, we just check whether we have already saved something with the chain, same name. If we have, we just compare it with the previous version. And if it is the same, as, well, if it is the same, then everything's good. And check returns true. If not, we return false. And we save both versions. This enables us to later list which of our tests were different and which of us, which of our tests were the same. So yes, I guess I'll keep it extremely short on this slide because it's really not so, so interesting code. You just should remember it's basically 10 lines or less. And then you have review and in review, you just load the two different files. Again, prepare a diff and print up the diff in some nice format. So here it's JSON. But you could also take two image files and just use pillow to say, okay, these pixels changed. 
or you could uh, use OpenPixel and load to Excel files, or it could already be to log files that you have pre-processed with some regular expressions. It's more the idea that counts and really this implementation. And finally, you approve, and approve just means, okay, take the new file, move it over the old file, and well, the whole process starts anew. There are some existing libraries. So if you're interested to see how other people implemented this, which is mostly interesting if you want to have really good implement, uh, integration into, for example, PyTest or other unit test frameworks, look at these. This one is, well, let's, let's say the, from a, lib, from a code writing perspective, I like it more. It's easier to handle. This one is interesting because it is the Python implementation of approval tests, which was originally written in C++. So it's an interesting different take on how approval tests can work in different languages. Yeah, and we've already reached the end. Why would you be interested in golden master tests, approval tests, snapshot tests, however you want to call it? Whenever you don't really want to write assert statements by hand, so if you have a complex object, you don't want to assert that every property is the same, but you want to test a lot of data at once, and your idea is that it won't change too much between runs. So, so when you do that, you just capture whatever is relevant, filter out everything that you don't need and compare the two versions with each other. And yeah, with, when you do this the right way, it may take some fine tuning, you will end up in a situation where the computer does most of the work for you and you just have to look at some results and decide whether it's still, comp still correct. So, well, it's basically a good combination of machine and your work. Why should you do it in Python? Well, because Python has so many modules that can help you to bring data into different formats, to filter out data that you don't need, to look at different output in so many different formats, that it makes it extremely easy to run these tests. So I would even say, even if you work in C++ or another language for your main implementation, it might be worthwhile to have some Python scripts just to run these specific tests. Because, well, it's basic data mining, and this is what one of the things where Python is really good. Okay, and that was it. So in the future, if you look at a large log file and say, okay, um, I don't know whether this is correct, you might just start to say, okay, what changes would I look at? What What's really the interesting part? And maybe you just start, I compare everything and then I select a certain part and then I automate the comparison process and I only look at it when this particular relevant part starts. Well, yeah, and that's it. It's a simple idea. It gets even simpler with Python. Yeah, we have a couple of questions. Uh, First one is from Andy. It's, uh, do you have any external tools to recommend? Are you <laughs> ask, uh, so yeah, so let me uh, tell one more. It's same from Andy. So something to use without editing the code. The code? Yeah. Okay, so the assumption is that your production code should not be changed and you want to compare the results. Well, you don't have to do the filtering in your production code. So let's let's take an example, take a log file. You could say I have run as part of my test preparation. I just break the log files into different segments and filter out the date. The results of those is what is finally saved and compared. Um, for external tools, there are many different diff tools. So I'm on the Mac, I lose and use um, Kaleidoscope which is basically just a three-way diff that can also compare images. And since most of the forms that I would work with are somewhat textual, it works quite well. So it can compare pretty pretty JSON, for example. I guess that Excel, for example, does have some kind of diff functionality. So you could use that. 
But I think ultimately the idea would be to combine some pre-processing, that's a filtering, and maybe some external tools, or well, if it is sim as simple as here, just print it out. It depends on how large your test is. So even if you if you put one use two megabytes of output and you don't want to change your code, I would still pre-process it so you look maybe at 10 little files and the initial approval test, the automatic part that sees that something has changed already guides you to the changed interesting segment. So Andy has a follow-up question on the same. Uh, he's saying whether this use, uh, whether like if replacing C or Perl version with Python script, uh, will that fit in that use case also if we just change the, or replace the C or Perl version with the Python script? The Perl version of of the of the yeah, of the product of the product of the system under test of the production system. I suppose so. Yeah, why not? It it depends on how much data you need to process. So, to give a counter example, if your C program is some kind of video edit, editing software and you have gigabytes of data that you have to test in something resembling real time then probably you would need something that is extremely optimal or quite optimized. And maybe you couldn't write a simple Python script. But if it is something where, well, that you can normally process in Python, then I would use it in Python. Of course, it depends. If you, everything, as usual, if your whole organization only knows C++ or C, and you are the only Python programmer there, then you probably wouldn't want to do it all in Python because your colleagues couldn't work with it. But yeah, it's, that's why there was this slide with the design decision. It depends extremely on what you want to do, what output you have. So for example, if you had video, I'm just thinking aloud, you could say, okay, I'm only look at every 50s um, frame and I want to see um, if there are large differences between what I would expect. So if I would usually expect somebody in front of a background like you with a Euro Python background and there's something completely black, just a black frame. This is something that you would need to review. Right. It's, 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 a, it's a tool list, you'll, ha you'll have to apply it. I think that answers the question. We have <laughs> last question from Christoph. Yeah, you were to mm -hmm. say something. Yeah, so if we want to get more specific, maybe we can do it afterwards in the chat. So because yeah. I'm quite curious what the scenario is. Yeah, so one question is there, uh, like, is this valid for database tables also? And if so, are there any frameworks to do so? <laughs> I'm not aware of any um, predefined framework. I'm pretty certain that you can do database stiffs. I would be extremely surprised if this wasn't a thing, given, well, how central databases are. Um, I guess what I would do just for me to keep the number of external libraries and external tools down is say what I'm primarily interested in and print that out. So if I have um, a standard test run that creates a customer, does some transactions and then writes it out, then I would look at these customer records only, even if I have some couple of hundred thousand other records in there just for load testing purposes or to provide some background. So the filtering part and the selection part, what is the change that I would expect that, what do I want to look at? That's um, something that is extremely application specific. And well, to come back to the original answer, I would just try to get it into some kind of difficult text format, also because I can then stir it in Git or some other format and look at changes over time, but it almost depends. So if you're talking about terabytes of data, that wouldn't work. All right. Right, I think, uh, yeah, that was quite a lot. So, yeah, thanks a lot for joining. Uh, people, please join uh, in talk test writing, uh, write themselves, uh, Brian breakout channel for any further questions if you have. And thanks a lot, Stefan, for joining. Welcome and have a good um, the remainder of the conference. Okay. Thank you.